This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic, and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. Today's episode is about a 1915 cross-country road trip made by suffragists to demand women's suffrage. At the 1915 World's Fair, held in San Francisco, California, and called the Panama Pacific International Exposition, The Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage, CU, sponsored a Freedom Booth, where they collected signatures for the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, which would grant women's suffrage. On September 15th and 16th of that year, the CU held a Women Voters Convention at the fair. By that point, the CU claimed to have collected 500,000 signatures on the petition. CU founder Alice Paul wanted to create a splash, bringing the petition to President Woodrow Wilson in D.C., and the CU nominated two envoys to drive across the country with the petition, stopping along the way to drum up support. The two envoys selected were poet Sarah Bard Field and drama critic Frances Joliffe. Both women were gifted orators long-time suffragists, and they represented western states where women had already won the right to vote. With the selection of the envoys, the CU still faced the problem of how to get them to D.C. Luckily, two Swedish immigrants and suffragists, Maria Kindberg and Ingeborg Kinstedt, had traveled by steamship from Providence, Rhode Island, through the recently opened Panama Canal to San Francisco to attend the Women Voters Convention, and had already planned to purchase a car there to drive back across the country. They agreed to drive the petition and the envoys to D.C. Maria purchased an Overland 6 convertible and took on the role of driver. Ingeborg served as the mechanic for the trip. With no major interstate highways yet crossing the country, they traveled on muddy and washed-out roads and faced both desert heat and Midwestern snowstorms. Francis Joliffe left the expedition almost as soon as they began, due to an unspecified illness, although there is speculation that she simply realized the trip would be too difficult. She joined up with the group later on the East Coast. Sarah Bardfield, Maria Kinberg, and Ingeborg Kinstedt kept up a grueling pace, traveling 3,000 miles over 10 weeks and crossing 18 states on their way to D.C. CU organizer Mabel Vernon traveled by train ahead of the car as the one-woman advance team, arranging for parades and parties and meetings with governors, mayors, and suffrage leaders for the trio, in towns along the way. Although Maria and Ingeborg were fellow suffragists, and Ingeborg lectured on suffrage in Rhode Island, 33-year-old Sarah did all of the public speaking on the trip. The image CU was looking to portray was that of young, fashionable, and articulate suffragists from Western states. And Swedish immigrants, Maria, age 55, and Ingeborg, age 50, did not fit the bill. Much of the press coverage of the trip focused on Sarah, ignoring the essential contributions of Maria and Ingeborg. As a result, tensions grew between Sarah and Ingeborg. When Sarah was interviewed about the trip many years later, she claimed that Ingeborg had threatened to kill her before the end of the journey. When they reached the East Coast, Francis Joliffe rejoined the car 
for the last leg of the trip to D.C. On December 6, 1915, the group finally reached their destination. The Overland Six festooned with a banner declaring, We demand an amendment to the United States Constitution enfranchising women, drove into D.C. in time for the opening of the 64th Congress and the first National Convention of CU held in D.C. A procession of 2,000 women escorted the envoys in a parade to the U.S. Capitol for a reception by a congressional delegation. President Wilson met with a smaller group of the suffragists, where Sarah Bard Field presented him with a copy of the petition. President Wilson welcomed them, but declined their request to mention women's suffrage in his upcoming annual address. He did promise to keep an open mind and confer with Congress. Women's suffrage amendments were introduced in the House and Senate in the following days, but they didn't pass. And it would be another three and a half years before the amendment would pass in Congress. To help us understand more about the 1915 suffrage road trip, I'm joined now by historian and activist Anne Gass, author of the 2021 book, We Demand the Suffrage Road Trip. Before my conversation with Anne, please enjoy a clip of a 1914 recording of Fall in Line, the Suffrage March, written by Zena S. Hahn and performed by the Victor Military Band. This recording has just entered the public domain for the first time due to the Music Modernization Act. Hi, Anne. Thanks so much for speaking with me today. Thanks for having me on, Kelly. Yeah. So tell me first how you first got interested, how you even heard about this suffrage road trip and how you got interested in writing about it. Yeah. So it starts back you know, almost 20 years ago. I, I started researching my great grandmother, who was a suffrage leader in Maine 100 years ago. And, uh, and in the course of that research, I came across references to this cross-country road trip that happened in 1915. And I always thought that must have been one hell of a trip in 1915, you know? And so uh, what was that like? And and uh, I, I I just thought if that would be, it would be a total trip to just re, you know, retrace their journey and, and try and learn more about it. And uh, so I didn't finish that first book about my great grandmother until about 2014. And, and so it wasn't until 2015 that I was able to to retrace their journey. And, and, um, and that was just such a great learning experience for me. But then in the course of, you know, spending almost 10 weeks coming across the country, uh, retracing their route, I started realizing that everything that had been written about this trip was from the perspective of uh, this sort of middle-class white younger woman, uh, Sarah Bard Field, and, and uh, two Swedish women who were pivotal to the trip's success, you know, were hardly even mentioned sometimes, uh, sometimes not at all. So that just really piqued my curiosity. So in addition to, to retracing their steps to doing this journey, uh, and I know you mentioned toward the end in your, your afterward or acknowledgements or something that, that you actually interviewed people along the way, like League of Women Voters and stuff along the way. So tell me a little bit about that, but then also the the other kinds of research you did uh, to learn more about the trip and uh, especially these two women, these two Swedish women. Yeah, so I um, I did a whole lot of different types of research. I mean, on the, on the way across the country, I I was really interested in understanding what difference having had the vote meant for women in the preceding hundred years. The the 
at least the women in the states that had enfranchised women through some sort of state action by 1915. And, and so that's why I did reach out to uh, leagues of women voters and women's rights activists. And just sort of, and, and a lot of them said, you know, the suffrage centennial is coming up and, you know, the, the, the stories that we've been telling about the suffrage movement in the U.S. are incomplete. Uh, they, they don't talk about black suffragists. They don't talk about, um, you know, Hispanic or, or Asian American women who were working on this. And um, they often, uh, they do, they did sort of cover labor to some degree, to a better degree, but still the, the focus was very much on white middle-class women who were affluent enough to be able to devote, you know, most or all of their time to suffrage. And those have become our suffrage sort of heroes over the years. And, and, um, and so I really heard that from so many places, it was impossible to follow through with my original intent, which was to write a nonfiction account of this this trip. The other reason, of course, was that the only person who had really left much of a written record was Sarah Bard Field, who was on the trip. But the two Swedes, to my, you know, as far as I was able to find out, had written very little, uh, if, if you know, and really nothing about the trip itself. Uh, so it was pretty hard to to find out much more about what they thought. One thing I did discover was that they had somehow somehow somebody had managed to get articles into Swedish language newspapers, and uh, amusingly, um, they typically did not even reference uh, Sarah Bardfield or this other woman, Frances Jolif, who was supposed to be on the trip. Uh, they only talked about the Swedes, and I just thought that was marvelous. I mean, you know, just uh, turnabout is fair play. I mean, if you for, if you like completely ignore my presence on this trip, I get to ignore yours when I when I control the the story. And um, so that's I, I, you know I, I kind of tucked that into the book as well because I just thought it was so interesting that that happened. So you decided to make this into a, a novel, into fiction, uh, so that you could sort of get into their heads a little more and and to sort of see it from their point of view. What what does that process look like? Sort of figuring out, you know, how much of the sort of documented story to include, how much to sort of stretch your historical imagination. Like what what does that look like putting it all together? Yeah, that that's an interesting question because it was, it was hard for me. I I'd, I'd never written a novel before, but also I wanted very much to make this a tribute to the grit and determination of the women who made the trip and the suffrage movement that launched it because I have, you know, a huge amount of respect for the vision and the the commitment and the just the the grind <laughs> that they had to go through to get there. So, um uh, but I did uh, quite a bit of research uh, into Swedish immigration history, so I could understand what it, you know, why the reasons why so many Swedish millions of Swedish people left the country and moved to the U.S. primarily um, in waves, successive waves, beginning in the mid 19th century. And and um, so I, I uh, Ingeborg and Maria came later, around um, 1888 and 1890, respectively. Um, they didn't know each other in Sweden either. They met in Providence, Rhode Island, um, where they both lived. Anyway, I did a lot of that kind of research. I also was really interested in what else was happening in early 20th century America. And, and uh, that's where I, I got interested in the, the industrial workers of the world uh, because Ingeborg, uh, one of the Swedish women, was a, a member of the IWW and um, would have known about Joe Hill, who was a fellow Swede. And so uh, one of the licenses, I guess, <laughs> poetic licenses that I took with a with a um, book was having her meet with him in in Salt Lake City when they came through there because he was in jail there. He was or in prison in Sugar House Prison. He was just weeks away from being executed for a crime that you know, in retrospect, it looks almost certain that he did not commit. But uh, uh, so and a lot of people thought that he was he was arrested and and eventually executed for being a, a radical labor activist. Um, so that kind of thing, I, I was really interested in this, this chatter that I was hearing a lot about leading up to the 2020 centen centennial about how racist the white suffragists were. And that kind of troubled me because I, it, that's not wrong. Uh, obviously there were you know quite a number of them who were just out and out racist, but I also felt like it was unfair to, the suffragists because um, the whole country was racist. It kind of, you know, it tagged them with a label that 
the whole country really still needs to own. And um, and so I kind of delved into that background as well, and and um, and have them meet with uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett when they come through Chicago, which again they didn't do, but you know she has a thing or two to tell them about what she thinks. And um, so I I uh, it was really just trying to um, kind of weave together this background to the trip because. You know, there's only so many times you can say, oh, well, they arrived in this city and they had a bunch of you know, suffrage meetings and they met these suffrage leaders and then they go to the next city and it was hard. You know, so, so I mean, part of it was just to add some more interest and depth to the story. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that comes through so strongly in your story is the sort of physical discomfort of this trip. <laughs> they, uh, you know, as you mentioned, this is a, a long, grueling journey but can you talk some about that that piece of it and uh, and why you sort of included that that sort of sensory description of of what this journey was really like for them? Yeah, I think that goes back to my initial interest in in this story, right? Because I I recognize that in in that you know in 1915 cars were still relatively new. I mean, they weren't even a decade old in terms of their availability and. Um, and for women to make that trip alone would have been unusual. Um, nowadays, we send women into space and don't think too much about it. But, uh, you know, a cross-country road trip by women, it, this wasn't the first one that was done, but it was close to the first. So I was just sort of curious about what it was like. And and I actually in, ended up buying myself a new car in San Francisco um, and driving that across the country. But my car had air conditioning and uh, heat. <laughs> and uh, good shocks and the roads were much better and it was exhausting. I mean, I, my drives, my daily drives were much shorter than theirs. I, I tried to mimic their itinerary. Uh, and, and so what I, I was filling up the rest of my time interviewing people and, and doing research at historical, uh, you know, libraries and museums. And so I, I was busy and I also did sometimes some talks. So I, I was feeling quite pressured and busy. And I I um I thought, well, if I'm feeling this way, then it must have been so much worse for them. So I, I thought it was just important for people to understand how physically difficult that trip was. And that really this was an example of the extraordinary efforts that women had to undertake in order to win the right to vote. Uh, this is just one example of that, but you know there were there were quite a number of others. Um, and, and in US history, that was kind of unprecedented. Nobody else had to fight this long. Uh, well, I mean, obviously that's not true for Native Americans and and uh, and uh, black and African Americans, but uh, you know, who went through far worse, but, but, uh, you know, it just, for, for men, especially for white men, I mean, if, if they wanted to enfranchise a group of, you know, say, well, okay, now all immigrants, even if they don't own property can vote, they just did it, you know, they didn't have to go through this generation, multi-generational fight for those rights. And um, so I, I just thought it was important to highlight the discomfort of the trip. And it, it also just added color to the stories. And I, I did, incidentally, I mean, some of the things that I highlighted did actually occur on that trip. They did get lost in the desert uh, and, and they do um, fail to turn up at a at an event in Kansas. Uh, they do get stuck in the mud. You know, there's these things did happen. And I, I just think that they were part of the reality of their trip. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite a... <laughs> It's like, oh my gosh, are they actually going to make it? You know, even you know, it, it's real history, and so of course we know that they do. But uh, yeah, several times along the way, it, it feels like there's just roadblock after roadblock, literally. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I, I think you know, that, again, that speaks to the incredible tenaciousness of of these women. Uh, you know, in the in the spring, in the winter and spring leading up to this this plan to trip, uh, the Congressional Union, which launched the program, uh, the, the, the journey, um, was thinking that they would send 100 cars across the country. And I, I just, in, in retrospect, that just seemed like lunacy to me. I mean, to have, first of all, to find 100 women to drive those cars, and, you know, I, I think would have been a stretch. They couldn't even find this one. I mean, until the Swedes showed up in the Congressional Union's booth at the Panama Pacific International Exposition, they you know, they didn't have anybody and, and the trip was just weeks away. So, but just the, then the mechanics and the logistics of getting all those cars fueled and getting them across a pass in a blizzard, you know, it's like, how on earth would they have done that? And it really, 
boiled down to these incredible women and and uh, and their resolve. And the other thing I thought was really important to note, and this is a woman of a certain age myself, uh, is that uh, the Swedes were middle aged. I mean, they were. The younger one was 50, uh, Ingeborg, and Maria was 55 at the age of this trip. And, uh, you know, to undertake such a grueling experience uh, at, at that age, uh, and they drove and maintained the car, too. I mean, which they, they got almost, they got very little credit for uh, along the way, and, and certainly historically. I, I think that's amazing. I couldn't freaking, you know maintain a car at my age right now uh if you, if you put a gun to my head i mean it just wouldn't happen and and uh you know cars were maybe simpler then but still it was quite an achievement yeah so uh, one of the things that you know every time we think about the suffrage story uh and and comes out here as well is that it's not just that there are uh antis so anti-suffrage people but there are disagreements within the pro-suffrage community about how to do this do we want a national amendment do we want it state by state should we try to push for the inclusion of african americans or not you know like what what all of this looks like uh, so can you speak some to that and, and in your research, what you found out about the, those sort of competing uh, visions of what suffrage should look like? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I, I, again, I have to sort of go back and, and, and say that my understanding and my thought process around this has really evolved uh, through the process of writing my first book about my great grandmother. And, and um, what I came to believe, uh, rightly or wrongly, is that I, I think a lot of it had to do with an under a lot of the disagreements had to do with what how people perceive the proper role of women. And uh, the Congressional Union w really was more radical in their views on that. They, you know, they I think they really foresaw the the winning suffrage as just the end of the first phase. I mean, that there was a whole lot more work to be done. And, and that, of course, you know, we know that's true because Alice Paul went along with um, some other folks, went on to author the, the Equal Rights Amendment and, and arranged to have that introduced in Congress in 1923. But the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which was the, the sort of legacy, more kind of staid group, really seemed to see it seemed to think of voting rights as kind of the end of the story in terms of what women you know, needed and, and should have. And, and not so much weren't so much focused on all those other rights um, that, you know, they, there was a real belief among even a lot of among a lot of suffragists that women belonged in the home, that they uh, you know, that they, that was their proper sphere and they, you know, they should be making a nice home for their husband and children and taking care of their loved ones. And that's all. So a lot of it has to do with, you know, people's perceptions of women's roles. But I think the other thing is, is whether or not women should be involved in politics and just the political strategies that they were using and social movements that unroll, unfurl kind of over decades, as this one did. All, always result in changes, right? Like, I mean, like even in the civil rights movement. I mean, Martin Luther King and the and the you know uh, the more peaceful approach that um, to uh, demanding rights was, you know, a strategy that was embraced by a lot. But then it became more militant after that, and we've seen that also in the the women's rights movement. I mean, there initially there was a focus on women's rights, but uh, Gender rights, you know, were you know there are a lot of a lot of feminists who did not believe that they should be supporting LGBTQ rights along the same at the same time, and that you know so so social movements do change over time, and that was certainly the case within the suffrage movement, and I, and I think the other thing I would just note, and I don't really highlight this in the book, but this trip in 1915 was really designed to unite suffragists across the country behind what they referred to as a Susan B. Anthony Amendment, uh, which is eventually, you know, what the 19th Amendment, um, it, you know, becomes the 19th Amendment. The Because there was an alternative um, referred to as the Shafroth Amendment, uh, which was another option for a, a, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, but it was kind of crazy. I mean, it would have, it would have been... Uh, just it would have required so much more work in order to get women the right to vote. And it would have ultimately driven that decision back to the states to decide 
not through ratification of the amendment, which they would have had to do, or but but also through uh, other state action. Th that's an example of the differences in strategy. There was there was a lot of focus on states' rights versus federal rights, and and so there were suffragists who believed that the Saf the, the Shafroth Amendment was the way to go because it would win over those people who you know were much more focused on states' rights. Uh, but it just it was a crazy idea. And, and I think it was the right decision to just go after the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, because, of course, the other thing was that the state's rights argument was really at its core racist. And, and, um, and it, it was really about uh, not wanting to inter the and sort of interfere with southern states decisions to disenfranchise their black populations. As you mentioned, their, uh, Ingeborg and Maria didn't leave much in the way of their own records. Uh, so what are, uh, you, you said that you looked at sort of Swedish immigration, but what are the ways that you sort of tried to get into what they might have been thinking and feeling and doing in this trip? Well, I did know a little bit about their backstories. I, I based on some information I was able to get from uh, like the Swedish. I'm going to get the name wrong, but Swedish like National Museum or something. Uh, so I knew that, uh, for example, Ingeborg had tried to go to the officer training school at the Salvation Army prior to her immigration. So I kind of wove that into the story, and I knew that Maria had become uh, a midwife and was a quite a successful midwife. And so I kind of used that in various ways to weave that into the story. She was always described by Sarah Bard Field and Mabel Vernon and some others as, you know, Maria was the sort of more maternal, caring, loving and warm individual, whereas Ingeborg was always viewed as, uh, or described as kind of this irascible, you know, kind of resentful and, and irritable kind of person. And I, I just, I thought about that a lot. And I, I started to think, well, wait a minute, maybe her irritation was justified because she would have been able to see as they came across the country that sometimes they weren't even mentioned um, when they were on the trip. So I, I, uh, I kind of used that as an excuse. Like that was her personality anyway. Yes, maybe, but, but she had some reasons to be, um, to be uh, angry about how she was being treated. And I guess the other thing that what really struck me in researching the early 20th century was how much it seemed like, uh, you know, early 21st century America. I mean, the uh, as I came across the country in 2015, uh, Donald Trump wasn't yet uh, the official candidate for the pre you know the Republicans in the presidential election, but he was making a lot of noise and. Uh, there was still, though, a lot of hope that Hillary would be the women's, the country's first woman president. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen. But as I was writing the book, there was, there was a tremendous amount of anti-immigration sentiment coming out of the administration and its supporters. Some, you know, fair amount of misogyny as well, and and uh, and I and anti-labor stuff. And I, I just thought, wow. I mean, we how far have we actually moved from 1915? Doesn't feel like that that far right now. So I kind of wove that into the book as well, I, just to try and show, I mean, for me, I was trying to make sense of what was going on in, in our time, uh, you know, against the backdrop of the country's history, I guess. So in the book, you have Maria and Ingeborg in a relationship. Is is there any evidence, uh, obviously could be the case, but is there any evidence that that they were in fact in a relationship? Yeah, I mean, I, I, they had lived together for 20 years. I mean, the census shows that they had lived together for 20 years in Providence. And, um, and while that wasn't uncommon, those so-called sort of Boston marriages, it, those tended to be, Boston marriages tended to refer to, as I understand them, more to more affluent people, uh, women who, who live together. And neither one of them ever married. There's no record of them, either of them ever having a child. So, um, you know, it wasn't out of convenience, you know, after a marriage failed or, or a husband died or something that they got together. And then when Maria died, actually, she died by suicide. We don't know why in, in uh, 1921, but she left all of her, her, her assets to Ingeborg the way you might to a spouse, right? I mean, as opposed to somebody you just roomed with. And uh, that, her will was actually challenged by Maria's siblings, two of Maria's siblings who still lived in Sweden. 
So from Sweden, they reached out and, and brought suit against Ingeborg um, and, and were unsuccessful in doing that. The court upheld uh, the will. And, and so I just thought that was really interesting. And it, and writing them, uh, you know, writing the book with them as lesbian partners, they allowed me to highlight some of the the queer history of the suffrage movement, which is another area that's just begun to emerge. I think other scholars, uh, you know, have, have really uh, tapped into that much, much more so than I have. But I, I just thought it was an important strain to bring out. Yeah. Was there anything as you were writing this, as you were doing your trip, as you were researching, as you were writing, that that really sort of jumped out at you, surprised you, you know, any any pieces of this that I, I mean, the whole thing is sort of <laughs> a, a wild story, but you know, any any sort of one thing that that really stayed with you? I would say a few things. One is that it just you know, how hard women had to work to win the vote. I mean, it, uh, we, we, as many times as you say that, it, it, it's hard to really uh, grapple with until you engage with the history and, and, and trace kind of what had to happen. And I think how I was also struck by just how, how close it came to not happening. I mean, or to taking longer than 19... 19- 20 because it came down to the ratification of the what becomes the 19th amendment comes down to just one state Tennessee a southern state a rate you know a state with a, a slavery history and uh and it won there by one vote and um so it it could easily have gone the other way and I you know just what would have happened if they hadn't been able to get it ratified and obviously that all happens after the 1915 road trip, but I'm just, you know, just sort of engaging with that whole history uh, amazed me. And I, there was another thing that uh, when I met with a League of Women Voters president out in Sacramento, California, uh, and she just said to me, why don't women run? Why don't women run for office? And I just looked at her and I, I felt completely guilty because I'd been urged to run for office a number of times and, and had refused. And, um, and I, that, that uh, conversation stayed with me uh, as I came across the country and in the years afterward. And so I, one of the reasons it took me so long to write this book was I ran for office in 2018. I ran for state rep uh, unsuccessfully, but um, I, you know, I think that it really made me feel like I had to step up. And uh, I think women do uh, to take on these offices because if we're not there to make the laws and on the policy that it, it may not be made in the ways that we want it to be. Yeah. Tell listeners how they can get your book. The book is on Amazon and there's a, um, there's both a uh, e-version as well as a, a, um, there's a hard cover and a soft cover. Uh, but also um, the publisher I used was Maine Authors Publishing and that's in Maine. So if you just Google that and go to their bookstore page, uh, you, you can search for We Demand the Suffrage Road Trip. Do you have any other books coming up? Anything you're, you're thinking about? I'm working on a few different projects. Uh, it's, it's, uh, none is really well underway at this point, I think. I, it, it's, uh, I'm, part of my problem is that I'm, I'm too much of an activist to be a good writer. It's hard for me to sit my rump in a chair and, and just write and write and write. I, I'd like to get out in the community and serve on Words. I'm on my town council now. I'm contemplating a run for state rep in 2022. So I'm, you know, it's it's hard for me to find the time. But um, yeah, I got some projects. Is there anything else that you wanted to make sure we talk about? I guess the other the other point I guess I'd like to make, and, and again in the you know against in the context of these extraordinary times that we're in now, is that the the, the woman suffrage movement was a peaceful revolution that unfolded over more than seven decades, if you trace it back to the Seneca Falls Conference uh, in, in Western New York, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and friends. And uh, in some degrees, that's in some ways, that's kind of an arbitrary uh, date. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's probably more appropriate to take it back to when the Constitution was first adopted, which is 132 years, you know, before the 19th Amendment was passed. But it was always peaceful, uh, and and uh, unlike the attack that took place on January sixth at the Capitol, I mean, these women just gave everything. Some of them just gave everything to this cause. They grew up and they grew old in the cause, and still died without seeing the right to vote. So I, I think 
it, that's a pretty unusual history um, uh, around the change of, you know, social movements and, and, and change. And I just think they should be recognized for that. Yeah. Well, Anne, thank you so much uh, for speaking with me. This was a really fun book. I enjoyed reading it a lot. And uh, and I knew nothing about this road trip before. Uh, so it, it really is sort of the the unsung uh, <laughs> hidden history that, that we like to highlight here. So thank you. Good. Thanks so much. And thanks so much for your podcast. It's a wonderful one. And I, I'm enjoying every one that I listen to. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends. MSW.